In 2024, Hamihai did something that might sound crazy to most .NET developers. He left Microsoft, switched gears to Swift, and in just a couple of months launched a stellar macOS application called Brilliant.Design. But here's is what makes this story interesting. How did a .NET expert with zero Swift experience build a successful Mac application so quickly? I needed to find out because if Hamihai could do it, maybe you could too. So I asked him to reveal the surprising skills that transfer seamlessly from .NET to Swift, how his deep knowledge of design patterns became his secret weapon, the exact learning path he recommends for .NET developers wanting to jump from .NET to any new technology stack, the full tech stack powering Brilliant.Design today, and I convinced him to share how he's using AI nowadays to develop Brilliant.Design. But first, I wanted to know one thing. Why walk away from .NET after all these years? I basically stopped working with .NET completely around August last year. So 2024, August, I think it's the last time where I properly worked professionally in .NET. And I left everything behind and I started working full time with Swift, JavaScript, frameworks I don't know, like uh, Swift UI, React, databases that I've never even heard of, Fauna DB, Fauna DB. So yeah, it's been a really, really interesting experience these past, I don't know, it's already eight, nine months. Yeah, so it's nothing related with all the crazy stuff that is going on in .NET with open source projects um, going mm -hmm. commercial and all of that. You are still friends with, uh, with .NET. Yes, one. it's nothing. I, I'm literally using nothing of what I've spent years mastering. So like ASP.NET applications, just being familiar with the ecosystem and the .NET framework in general. And today I'm not using any of it whatsoever. Yeah, that, that's the interesting part for me is that you, you left all the things behind, all the things that you were known for. You need courage for that. So you are building a YouTube channel as well. You have courses on .NET and you take that decision. Okay, let's try to build this thing, but this thing needs a, a different set of skills that, from the ones that I have. How did you approach that transition from going from .NET to Swift? I actually never planned to switch lanes, so to call it. This wasn't something I was planning to do. It wasn't like a choice that I made in a single day. It's just, I don't know, I was sad one day. I was bummed from something. I don't even remember what it was. And I was lying in bed and Leo, my wife, told me, try building some project or something. It always makes you feel better. So it's been a while since I built an open source library or anything whatsoever. And I decided that, yeah, what the heck, I'll try building some screen annotation software because I've been using tools like Presentify, Zoomit. If you're on Windows, you're probably familiar with Zoomit. Yes. I've been using these type of tools for years and I always had things that I wish would have been done better. If it's the Zoom fun functionality, if it's being able to add images, if it's being able to manipulate the annotations, the actual elements. So after annotating on the screen, being able to move things around, et cetera, et cetera. So I was like, yeah, let's start working on a tool similar to that. Let's see how it goes. By this time, we're talking about August last year, by this time, I'm already well proficient with using Claude, ChatGPT, whatever, all the various LLMs. I've been using them extensively through, throughout everything I've been doing for the past couple of years already. I've never built a Mac OS application. I don't know Swift. I don't know Swift UI. After 24 hours, I had a pretty solid screen annotation app, like rectangles, circles, lines, more or less all the basic functionality that I needed I had done in 24 hours. Then I was like, whoa, this is actually really, really fun. So I continued working on that, adding images, just making the experience better with the goal of making it like the most powerful screen annotation software specifically for my needs. So as a YouTube content creator and a course author, then what I do all day, every day is try to explain myself in front of the screen. And all I have at my disposal is this face <laughs> and the screen, all I have other than that is like screen annotation tools. And it's really not enough to convey what I'm trying to explain, especially if it's complex say, architectures, if it's design patterns, even, even if you're just talking about like, I don't know, a person and their history, it's, it's hard to, ex to explain it properly on the screen. So what I did, that's what I've been doing for the past few years is I've been getting more and more proficient with Figma 
using Figma to basically as a canvas. So drawing, creating also UI mockups, but like diagrams of systems, et cetera, et cetera. I did everything in Figma. While I was building this app, I was thinking to myself, I want to do everything here. Like I don't want to switch between Figma and using the screen annotation. And it was very natural to start adding features that I'm familiar with from Figma. Or it's not specifically Figma because all the editing apps whatsoever, Sketch, Illustrator, etc., all these apps have the same functionality of just uh, editing, like vector editing. And, and slowly it became bigger and bigger. And I think about three weeks in, I realized I can, I can build... I can build a graphic design tool, like legit today with AI. Before we keep going, let me tell you that members can access the full conversation. To become a YouTube member, simply click the join button. Let's say that I'm a new developer joining your company. Your, I'm your first hire and it's my first job and I'm looking for career recommendations. Based on your experience of moving from one stack to the other, what's the types of of things that you would recommend me to study? Is it mm -hmm. a tech stack? Is it LLMs? Is it design patterns? Mm -hmm. What it is? That's an amazing question. Honestly, that's such a good question because in August last year, I was also on a podcast with Nick Constantino. I hope I'm not butchering your last name. And what I thought then is a bit different than what I think today. So if you want, you can watch what I said there. I don't remember exactly. But my views on how to learn things using AI shifted completely. So today, the importance of languages, frameworks, libraries, anything that is like not the fundamental problem solving aspect of a challenge, if it's a coding challenge or anything in general, in my opinion, not worth investing any, any time whatsoever. The only thing that's important is to understand how things work from like, we're all architects now. So performance, like if, for example, I don't know, something isn't working fast enough as you want, then you need to be familiar with caching and indexing. If you want your system to be modular, then it's good to be familiar with different design patterns that allow that. Being familiar with the underlying fundamental building blocks of computer science is way more crucial, in my opinion, than knowing, like, for example, being familiar with the fact that there is such a thing as page, page faults in the OS, that's important. Knowing the nitty gritty of the schema and blah, 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 the specific operations. And I don't even know to say specific random things because I don't know myself. But like that level, when you need to learn it, it's very easy to learn it. But the building okay. blocks is the only thing, in my opinion, that today is really, really crucial. Can you guide us through the basic overview of your tech stack nowadays? We know no. Swift already. Yeah, yeah, sure. So there are a few aspects. There's the client application that's sitting on the Mac uh, computer. That is 100% Swift. Oh, actually not 100%. Swift, Object-C, Objective-C. And then there are various frameworks like Swift UI, AppKit, Core Graphics, blah, 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 those kind of stuff, just to make everything work on the client. Then we have the backend. So the system is built upon licenses. So when you purchase you will receive a license. So there needs to be some backend that knows how to work against some database and see how many devices you have active, make sure that it's limited to the number of devices. If you cancel your, your license or you ask for a refund, I need to know how to handle that. So I'll start from the database. The database is FaunaDB. They're actually closing, so I need to switch databases, funny enough. But yeah, I used FaunaDB. Anyway, whatever. So that's for the database. The backend server is written in JavaScript and uh, Express as the framework. That's the backend. The front end of the website is React and JavaScript. What else? The app itself is uploaded to uh, AWS, like a bucket. And uh, that's more or less it. From this conversation, one thing that I get is that you are likely the um, developer that I know that took most of the advantage of AI so far because you have been immersed on using AI to build something that you are not familiar with, with tools that you are not familiar with for a long time, almost a year already. Maybe there's something you can share on that. What types of tools are you using nowadays? Uh, are you using a specific IDE? Are you using just something like ChatGPT or Cloth? What are you using nowadays? So before I answer that, I do want to say something important. It's very, very important to talk, like going back to the building, to the building blocks. Even if I'm not familiar with Express and JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera, but knowing authentication, authorization, 
knowing the dangers of just like a DDoS attack. Those things are really, really important to understand. And if you're watching this and you're thinking of doing something similar, it's very important, the very least, talk to your LLM and ask what's the dangers here. Like what happens if someone makes a million requests, et cetera, et cetera. That's the thing that many talk about of the future of being a developer with AI, if we need to, to learn software engineering or not, if we need experience or not, that, that's the difference because you are the operator, but you know how to fly the plane, right? Right, exactly. Uh, you so know. if you're using the lovable and you're just like, yeah, what the heck, it looks good, I'll push it to production and then your, I don't know, API keys are exposed then you need to know, you need to know what API keys are. You need to know why it's dangerous. The building blocks are really, really important. And you can ask an LLM <laughs> to teach you the building blocks. So to answer your question, so I'm, I basically used ChatGPT up until about, I think a year and a half ago. That's when I started using Claude. First was 3.5 Sonnet, was way better than ChatGPT. Pretty shortly after that, I canceled ChatGPT, switched to Claude. And ever since then, I've been testing every single model that came out. So if it's Gemini, Grok, everything, basically all the various LLMs. And from my experience, nothing really compares. My, my use case is a bit different than others. So for me, I need to give the LLM around at least 10,000 lines of code as context. And only then it has enough context to help me out with what I need. And other models struggle with that. So I haven't been able to switch to any, anything else other than Claude. Now I use Claude 3.7. I'm stuck with Claude 3.7. Great. So one final important question. Let's say that I'm starting today to build something like you have done. I want to go to a different tech stack. Doesn't matter if it's Mac OS or whatever, I have an idea for a product and I'm going to start. I've been building software with .NET for a long time. You are my mentor. What do you recommend me to do in terms mm -hmm. of mindset, in terms of approach? Mm -hmm. One, ask yourself, is the LLM going to write it faster than me? Yes or no. Is the LLM going to write it better than me? Yes or no. If it's two yeses, 100% use the LLM. If it's going to write it faster, but not better, then make sure to review the code or at least have a high level understanding of what's happening. For me, I keep asking myself, is it worth my time writing? Because in the end, what's expensive is time. So if you can get something done in a day instead of a month, that's priceless. What will get it done the fastest? And that's the, literally, that's the only measurement that matters to get, get it done. It needs to be secure. It needs to be, you need to have privacy in mind. There are various aspects that you need to maintain. But taking all of that into account, that's true, like regardless of how you're implementing it, what will get it done the fastest and, and in the best way possible. And if it's the LLM, then use the LLM. Don't waste your time, even if it's like tempting to just write it out. Sometimes, you know, you know, you probably know when you're writing a, a line of code, and you're like, I can just copy the line three lines above. I can just copy it and paste it. Should I continue writing? I'm already typing half of the sentence. If it's faster to go and copy the line, that should be the only metric. And more and more as LLMs improve, it's just monitoring the answer, but using the LLMs extensively. Check out the links in the description to follow Hamihai and Brilliant Thought Design. And if you want to learn how to take the best out of AI as a developer, check out this video next, because it will show you a quick way to improve your life.